On the 16th of April 791, Merrick inherited the throne from his father at the age of 17. Merrick knew it was now down to him to secure his family's position. His father managed to secure a small slice of the British Isles, but there was no guarantee that he could keep it. So, he vowed to dedicate himself to the rulership of Kent. Shortly after Merrick's coronation, he was approached by Willem the Blind who tried to convert him to his new one true faith, Lollard. Apparently since Cathar did work on his father, he went with something different this time. But regardless, Merrick ordered him arrested, and like before, he quickly came back to the Catholic faith. In April 792, his brother, friend, and heir, Edmund, came of age and was soon married. In November that same year, he was presented with an idea by his steward to construct a statue of Merrick just like his father. Except this time, instead of the humble life-size one of Dale in the market, they wanted to construct a massive statue in the castle grounds. Merrick of course agreed, and the next year on the day of the unveiling, the castle grounds was opened up to the public. The statue depicted Merrick in his full regalia with his sword held above his head. Two days later, his first son Cyrus was born. Merrick was happy. Kent was the wealthiest land in all of Britain, his son was born, his statue was finished, and his land was at peace with no challenges to his rule. This would last for all of about a month before his world would start crumbling around him. In December 793, a new age had begun, the Age of the Vikings. The centralization of power and the population explosion in Scandinavia had begun sending these men to faraway lands in search of wealth, and in some cases, land. In January of 794, Earl Ethelwine died while investigating corrupt nobles in King's Harbor. Unfortunately, his soon-to-be son was not yet born, which meant that Sussex fell to his sister instead. This would not have been too much of a problem, except that she was betrothed to the Earl of Surrey, and together they started to get ideas. Dangerous ideas. In April 795, Merck's Chancellor managed to fabricate Merck's claim on the country of Middlesex. How? Well, a lot of bribes, a lot of threats, a lot of fabricated papers. But regardless, Merck now had a claim. Merck was waiting for his treasury to recover from the expense, when suddenly he received reports of over 500 men raiding and pillaging the countryside. Apparently these Northmen had heard of the wealthiest land in North Britain, and decided to go see for themselves. Merck up until this point had only heard rumors of these men, but undeterred, he gathered up all the men he could, and charged out to beat them in battle. Merck's 700 men found the Vikings pillaging the lands around Rochester, and took them by surprise while they were in the middle of Luden. The fighting was fierce, but the battle-hardened men of Dalen's campaigns managed to eventually break through their lines and force them into retreat. This was only the beginning of what was to come. In August 795, Merck wrote into law the ruling lord's right to revoke the titles of his subjects. This annoyed both the Earl of Surrey and the Countess of Sussex, who traveled to Kins Harbor and met with Merrick. They proposed a 40 be sure between the three of them. After all, Merrick was still young, and the new friend of the Vikings would pull him away from his dues to the realm, so sharing the burden would be in everyone's best interests. Merck flatly refused. He hoped this would be the end of it. He was wrong. After they left Kins Harbor, the couple began plotting. If Merck wasn't going to agree willingly, they would just have to force him into accepting their power sharing arrangement. This all came to a head when on the 4th of October, 796, Merck received a message. To this spoiled child. For too long you have selfishly refused to share power like the upstart peasants you are bred from. This arrangement is no longer in ours nor the realm's best interest, and so we offer you one final chance to come to your senses and be spared humiliation. Submit to our demands peacefully, or meet our armies in the field. The choice is yours. At first, Merck was in shock. And then he flew into a rage. He knew that they were upset when he refused their proposal. But to stoop to such treachery! Merck didn't try to defuse the situation. In fact, he escalated by practically daring them to fight him, and promising to finish what his father started once they did. On the 7th of October, what will be known to history as the Petty Revolt began, with both sides racing about 650 men. Merrick's opening move was to march towards the much weaker force of Sussex, who were waiting for reinforcements from Surrey. The plan was to, at the very least, engage Sussex before they had a chance to join together. However, marching much faster than Merrick had anticipated, Earl Egfrith managed to beat him there. Then suddenly a band of 42 people from the village of Hurl turned up, and asked the Countess Whisper to be allowed to fight. She of course accepted, but asked why they wished to do so. Well, it turns out that at some point, Merrick was presided over a particularly nasty case where a man was accused of butchering his wife and child, and was found close to the scene covered in their blood. Despite pleading his innocence, Merck decided to throw him in jail, believing that there was enough evidence to justify his decision. However, years later, the exact same case would happen in another village, and the killer was caught red-handed and killed when he tried to escape. The people of Hurdle, who always believed the man was innocent, hoped he would be released from prison. However, it turned out that he actually died months earlier. The man's closest friends and relatives then gathered up a group and went to help in the fight. In the Battle of Luz, Merrick's army managed to emerge victorious, driving off the rebel army, and he began the siege. However, shortly after he changed his mind and gave chase to the now much further away rebel forces. It was at this point that he also received a betrothal offer from the kin of West Francia to marry his half-sister Blanche. He accepted. 
Merrick chased the fleeing army north, expecting to ransom them somewhere around Leicester. However, he instead ran to them around Northampton when they were coming back south. At the Battle of Crownland, Merrick once again routed the enemy army and showed his men just how brave he was. It was then a march south as they fought again in Sussex, where for the third time Merrick smashed the rebel army, and this time, satisfied that the enemy army was beaten, he dug in for a siege. In July of 797, however, a massive band of over a thousand Vikings began raiding the countryside of Kins Harbor. Even at full strength, Merrick could barely raise enough men to drive off such an attack, and now he didn't stand any chance. What's worse, in Surrey, Earl Ekfrith was pulling together more men to join his rebel army. In December 797, Merrick finally took control of the rebel capital of Selsey, and he was confident with the victories under his belt he could force the couple to surrender. However, with one last throw of the dice, Earl Ekfrith led the rebel army back towards Sussex. The battle and soon began to turn against Merrick when he suddenly broke through the enemy lines and ran straight towards the enemy camp and ran right to the tent of the Earl and Countess, who were already celebrating their presumed victory. On the 1st of January 798, at Sword Point, the Earl and Countess surrendered. As both poetic justice and revenge for the treason, Merrick used his newfound powers to revoke the towels and claim them for himself. This now made Merrick the undisputed ruler of Kent. Well, an undisputed ruler whose capital is currently under siege by a horde of Vikings. Merrick tried to raise levies from his new lands of Sussex and Surrey, however the Civil War left them kind of exhausted, and in the end he could only raise about 650 men, half the number of the Vikings. This was it, Merrick thought. The Vikings would sack the city of Kins, ransack the wealth of the land, and destroy everything him and his father had built. On the 20th of March, the garrison of Kins Harbor, on the brink of starvation, decided they would try to negotiate a surrender. However, once they looked out over the walls, there was no one there. Well, it turns out that after eight months of raiding, pillaging, and sieging the lands of Kins Harbor, with no sign of the garrison surrendering, and no idea how much food was left inside the walls, the Viking in charge decided, well, this is pointless, and just left with all the wealth they had already looted. Little did he know just how close to victory he was. In any case, this was a miracle for Merrick, as on return to Kins Harbor, he was given the credit for driving off the Viking invaders and saving the city. He had no idea what they were talking about, but hey, he was more than happy to accept the credit. Merrick would later ransom off the former Earl and Countess to the Earl of Lindsay, who was willing to pay for them. He wanted to kill them, but after the expense of the Civil War, he decided gold was preferable to blood. Plus, it did make him look good to the people being all merciful and stuff. However, the village of Hurdle would not be given any such mercy. He had heard of the townsfolk who had gone out of their way in order to support the rebels, and so he had ordered his men to dress as Vikings and burn the village to the ground. However, they would always come back and rebuild, so every few years, Merrick would order the damn thing be burned to the ground again. It became quite the odd tradition, but that's where we get the term, I've got to burn down that hurdle. One afternoon, Merrick was brought a woman who was accused of using witchcraft. Apparently she was performing dark rituals to make the crops fail, although Merrick was not convinced. It was also said that apparently when he was a sickly baby, his father's court physician saved him using witchcraft as well, and was using dark rituals to control him. He never believed any of that, so he ordered her release, much to the crowd's shock. Now, from September 799, Mercy was being invaded by a massive host of Vikings led by the King of Denmark, who should not only just raid, but also conquer. Most of the petty kingdoms of Britain had joined together to fight off this foe, and although Merrick considered joining together to drive off the invaders from the shores of Britain, he instead decides to push his claim on the county of Middlesex. He set out with over 1,200 men and smashed the enemy at the Battle of London. However, a small group of 21 men were lagging behind, and were copied over 700 men from Essex and were swiftly killed. This was the first ever defeat for any army flying the Howister Banner, if you can even call it a battle. Merrick quickly turned around and defeated them at the Battle of Sandwich. Merrick was in the middle of a siege when word began to spread. The Abbasid Empire in the Middle East had been overthrown by some zealous tribesmen, and suddenly, the whole empire came crashing down. Merrick pondered the similarities to how his father took power, and got on with his day. Soon after, he received a message from the King of West Francia, asking for his half-sister's hand in marriage now that she had come of age. In August, while still sieging Westminster, he received word that his brother, friend, and former heir, Edmund, had fled north beyond the old Roman wall, and was hiring men to press his claim on the throne of Kent. Merrick sent word to his brother asking him to give up this nonsense and come back home, but he refused. Merrick would have to deal with his brother on the field of battle. In the final battle against the War of Essex, Merrick was wounded, but soon after managed to secure a surrender. Not long after, seeing the war against the Danish was almost over, Merrick joined in with his 1,100 men and quickly slaughtered 89 Vikings raiding in Bedford before the final peace was made. Another great victory for Merrick Howitzer. In February 802, Merrick made a formal alliance with the King of West Francia, who then wanted his new allies to join him in fighting his foe, which of course, Merrick agreed to. The only problem was Kent didn't actually have any boats, and he didn't have any means of making a. After all, Kins Harbor was only really set to handle ships and not build them. So Merrick gathered all his men on the shores of Kins Harbor and told them if God wished him to cross, he would surely part the sea. With everyone in Kent satisfied that Merrick had done all he can to win his ally, he disbanded his army and went about his business. 
In August 802, Edmund Hounser gathered his host and marched south towards Kins Harbor to confront Merrick in battle. Merrick sent words to his rubber lot sent troops. Believe it or not, he didn't. On the 10th of November, Edmund's host engaged Merrick at Kins Harbor. Merrick's army fought with everything they had, but in the end, Edmund's host drove them from the field. Merrick is quoted to have said, If only father could have seen his sons join everything he had worked for. Merrick managed to regain control of his scattered forces and marched them down to Surrey where he planned his next move. With no hope from the continent coming, he turned to mercenaries, spending almost every last coin in his nation's treasury to hire a group called the Saxon Band. After a brief rest to allow the mercenaries to collect themselves, Merck marched out to save Kins Harbor yet again. This time with his brother's army outnumbered two to one, he was quickly forced to retreat. Merck then disbanded the expensive mercenary forces and marched out after him. At the Battle of Chester, Edmund's exhausted host finally gave in, and he was forced to surrender. In the end, Merck allowed his brother to return to court, but not until he was tarred and feathered and wheeled around Kins Harbor for all to see. It was said that Edmund was humbled by this punishment, and promised never to step out of the line again. In November 804, measles broke out in Kins Harbor, and in response, Merrick ordered that the gates be shut, and no one be allowed in under any circumstances. He was not about to let some disease take what he had shed blood to hold. Merrick then began throwing people out of the castle that he even suspected of catching the affliction, from the old courtiers to even his own niece. Although, to be fair, it was his rebellious brother's daughter, so maybe there was other motives at play. While the wars on the continent began to wrap up, Merrick remained sealed behind the walls of his castle, all the while telling himself that even if he opened the gates, there was nothing that could be done for the people outside. It was only after the epidemic was confirmed to have ended, and when the Vikings came to ransack the slightly emptier countryside, that Merrick finally opened the gates. The men were still a little bit sore about the whole abandonment fin, but while they battled against the Viking force more than a thousand men, Merrick proved just how much of an inspiring leader he really was. In April 807, Merrick followed in his father's footsteps in the court of East Anglia to turn them into a tributary. In the ensuing Battle of Waltham, Merrick was the first man to charge into enemy lines, personally slaying at least ten men in the melee. It was on that day that he earned the title, Merrick the Bold. London would be occupied while Merrick maintained his siege in East Anglia. However, once he marched south and doubled the remaining East Anglian forces, a peace was quickly reached. It was at this point that people finally believed he had surpassed his father's achievements. After he returned home from East Anglia, Merrick finally began focusing on his son and heir, Cyrus. He decided to formally introduce the 14-year-old to all the important vassals of the realm, so he could make connections and learn a thing or two in the process. The evening was a mixed bag of well-managed introductions and unfortunate mishaps. However, for better or worse, he was formally introduced to the world. What Merrick didn't know at the time, however, was Cyrus was, in fact, gay. In April 809, Merrick once again was called upon by his brother-in-law to help in a war, which he agreed to, but this time flat out asked, Are you going to send us any ships ferries across this time? The messenger didn't reply, and once again the armies of Kent made sure that the enemy didn't try to sneak attack from the British Isles. In November that same year, smallpox broke out at Kins Harbor after it swept down from the north. The gates were shut just before his son Cyrus came of age, but despite this, Merck still managed to arrange a marriage for him, with a woman who, by some cruel twist of fate, also turned out to be gay. Merck's daughter was soon married off to the kin of Burgundy, East Francia, and Bavaria, and he also learned that the war against the Might had been lost. In November 811, Merck declared war in Wessex in order to make them a tributary of Kent. He called upon his other subjects in East Anglia, as well as his brother-in-law, the kin of West Francia, in order to aid him. At the head of over 2,000 men, Merrick entered the lands of Wessex, laying siege to Winchester. Merrick, however, learned that the main armies of Wessex were only marching a few miles away, so he broke off the siege and marched to engage them. The forces from Wessex managed to run into the soldiers sent from East Anglia, and a battle ensued. Merrick and his forces soon joined the fight, routing the enemy. Merrick was shown to be a proven battle commander. After killing off the remaining forces that were grouped not far from the field, Merrick learned that the kin of Wessex managed to raise another army, and was now sieging his lands in Sussex. Packing up once again, Merrick marched to confront him what he hoped would be the conclusive battle. The battle that followed would be the death nail of their resistance, as the king, who by all accounts was suffering from great pox and was most likely insane, led a suicidal charge on Merrick's lines and was cut down by his brother Forsworn, who was rewarded for this accomplishment after the battle with the title of Master of Horse. After a few successful sieges by the Free Armies, the new king of Wessex finally surrendered in April 813, bringing their lands under Merrick's banner. In June of that same year, Merrick's first grandson George was born to his son Cyrus. In August 814, Merrick declared war on Mercia hoping to take the whole of Canterbury, which was currently under the Mercian rather than Kentish rule. He called upon all his allies and subjects, including the newly conquered Wessex, and went to work. A funny thing happened though, as it turns out the armies of West Francia were still stuck in Britain, waiting to be picked up to go home. However, after the months since the victory, the only boat that came was the one carrying the messenger, ordering them to now head north to invade Mercia. Quite rightly, they were furious. What? What do you mean by war of Mercia now? We've been waiting to go home for months, and you expect us to just turn around and fight another enemy for the king's greedy brother-in-law? 
No, we're not moving from this spot unless on a boat headed home. While the armies of West France here were almost in revolt, Merrick marshaled all his men outside of Canterbury for the siege, despite the pleadings of the priests. In the meantime, an almost 2,000 strong army from Mercia entered Kent and attacked Surrey after hearing the Frankish army's refusal to help in the conflict. Merrick, still tied down in Canterbury, sent a message to the Franks promising them proper food and lodging in Kent until they were ferried home, if they agreed to drive back the Mercian army. After months of living off the land, they accepted his offer. The Mercian general was shocked to learn that the massive Frankish army was suddenly behind him and looking for a fight. Though at Lambeth he tried to make a defense, which was made harder after Merrick ended the siege and joined the fight, he was driven from the field with over 800 dead. As promised, the Frankish army was given a place to stay in Sussex until they were picked up. After another victory and another successful siege in Bedford, Mercia surrendered in October 814. Merck then raised his nephew Walrun to the position of Bishop of Canterbury. In July 815, Leofwin died at the age of 42 due to poor health, and soon after, Merck married Cecilia. In September of that same year, Merck ordered the construction of Kings Harbour's first hospital in the memory of his wife. In November 816, an emissary of the Pope arrived and asked that since the clergy had been heavily involved in the construction of the new hospital, that's only fair that they got compensated. Merrick agreed wanting to have the approval of the Pope, not only for the hospital, but for his family as well, and finally put the Harrowser dynasty on the same standard as the other great houses of Europe. In April 817, Merrick declared war for his claim on Essex. This war was a relatively standard affair of battles and sieges, however one notable aspect is Merrick did actually get food poisoning while on the march, which removed him from any personal commands. It took till November for him to fully recover from his illness, but in June 818, Essex was finally under his control. In January 819, Merrick began construction on Kins Harbour's first shipyard in the hopes of turning his conquest south towards the continent. He planned to invade Brittany and he sent his brother Edmund there to forge a claim. In the meantime, he had declared war on Cornwall in the hopes of uniting all of southern Britain. His subjects of Wessex and East Anglia joined in, and with 2,500 men, Merrick marched south. He initially avoided fighting the 3,000 Cornish troops sieging in Wessex, however they were soon sent back west to fight off the 900 troops from East Anglia, which were already in Cornwall. This was perfect though, as Merrick had now cornered the Cornish army, meaning he could deal with them at his leisure. However, this turned out not to be the case, as the Cornish piled a thousand of their men onto boats, and sailed straight for Middlesex. Merrick quickly finished off the 500 men he still found in Cornwall, before heading off home, to remove them from his lands, which he accomplished in the Battle of London. Afterwards, peace was made, and Merrick, though not directly, ruled the entire southern coastline of Britain. It was at this point that Merrick was beginning to crack under the stress of rulership, at one point simply pushing his way off the room because the day's hearings got too much for him. Personally, he preferred the battlefield. In August 823, Merrick was diagnosed with cancer and was told he wouldn't have much time left. Merrick asked his core physician to do what he could to make him better, however, this turned out horribly, and the operation left Merrick on death's door. For the next few months, men at court believed that Merrick's time was up. But somehow, Merrick fought on, and even got his physician to operate on him again, if only to fix his mistakes the first time round. This time was successful, and although he still had cancer, he will be able to operate as he used to for the time being. In January 826, while Merrick waited out another plague on his doorstep, an adventurer, who looks suspicious like his old rebellious brother, laid claim to his lands. Merrick relished the opportunity to fight off yet another claimant just like the old days. In February 827, Merrick learned that his son and heir, Cyrus, had suddenly inherited a castle in the heart of Mercia, and was now required to leave Kins Harbor to become their queen's subject. Merrick warned his son against such an obvious plot to turn her rival's heir into a glorified hostage, but Cyrus didn't care. At this point, he had grown tired of his father and not been able to rule in his own right, and shortly afterwards, departed for his new lands. Surprisingly enough, with someone to fight on the horizon and his son not being around anymore, he seemed to have not only proved his mood, but his health as well. In June 827, the kid of West Francia died, leaving Merrick's nephew on the throne. In January 828, Merrick learned that the adventurous host had assembled. In response, Merrick called all his subjects and allies and gathered together an army in Kins Harbor to wait the invasion. And so he waited. And waited. And waited. He even built a training ground in Kins Harbor just to keep his men occupied. And then he asked what the hell was taking them so long. Well, it turns out that that adventurer came from West Francia and was now stuck in a siege of Orleans. After around a year of waiting, Merck decided that it was finally done and sent his levies home. After a few months, he had pretty much forgotten about the whole thing and actually declared war on Mercia for his claim in Oxford, when in November, men suddenly showed up flying the adventurer's banner and began a poorly executed siege of Kins Harbor. When he was told the news, Merck laughed so hard he fell out of his chair, and he rode out with his men and smashed the army into the ground. After that pleasant distraction, he gathered 4,500 men and marched on Oxford to break the Mercian forces there. He then got a report that the funny little adventurer's army was fighting in Wessex, and decided to head there to finally deal with them once and for all. He won and captured the man in charge. Merck then disbanded his army for a while as he pretty much ran out of money, 
but he would soon meet Mercy on the field of battle in Wessex, where he once again claimed victory. Mer quickly learned, however, that they had captured an enemy noble. He went to the prison cell to see what they had captured, and oh Christ, it's Cyrus. Yes, it turns out that Cyrus was not only leading the enemy forces, but in the ensuing melee, he was pulled from his horse and knocked unconscious. Merrick didn't know what was worse, that his son was willing to take up arms against him, or that he was so terrible at doing so. In any case, Merrick had taken his son back to Kins Harbor and put him under house arrest. In June 841, Merrick had won the war and claimed Oxford, and he told his son to just leave, and not come back until Merrick was dead and buried. Then he publicly humiliated the adventurer who tried to usurp him, by locking him up in the stockades in the town square. On the 11th of December, 841, Duke Merrick died of cancer at the age of 58, leaving his throne to his 48-year-old son, Cyrus, as well as his lands of Middlesex and Essex to his son Andrew, and Oxford to his son Robert. He died after having six children. In Merrick's life, he had forced past his father in his accomplishments, by doubling the size of Kent, and extending his rule over the whole of southern Britain. He fought off claimants to the throne both from within and without, and cemented the Howitzers as one of the great houses of Britain. It is for this reason that we know him as Merrick the Bold.